On September 3, 1783, Great Britain and the 13 colonies signed the Treaty of Paris, officially ending the Revolutionary War and creating the United States of America. It was a celebration for the colonists, but not so much for the Native Americans. For the next 100 years, the U.S. Army would wage another series of wars, a continuation of the so-called Indian Wars. What happened to Native Americans after battling on the American frontier? Battle of the Wabash In November of 1791, a large force of Native American tribes formed a confederation to resist U.S. expansion into their homelands in the Midwest. Led by Chief Little Turtle of the Miami tribe, Chief Blue Jacket of the Shawnees, and Chief Bucangahelis of the Delawares, they routed a 1,000-man U.S. force led by General Arthur St. Clair along the Wabash River in Ohio. St. Clair's men were a bad combination of overconfident and underprepared. They were encircled and suffered over 600 casualties in just three hours. Only 24 of the survivors left the assault unscathed. The overwhelming victory, the Native Americans' biggest ever over the newly founded United States and its army, prompted an entire overhaul of the U.S. military. The U.S. Army would return to the region with a vengeance. Battle of the Fallen Timbers Nearly three years later, in August of 1794, that same Native American Confederacy had set up a defensive position near the Maumee River in Ohio to resist General Anthony Wayne's advancing American Legion. President George Washington had just made him commander of the new unit, and Wayne had earned the nickname Mad Anthony during his service in the Revolution. On August 20th, Wayne attacked the Native forces. After only an hour of fighting, the Native American warriors were routed, with about 40 killed and Chiefs Igushawa and Little Otter wounded. Thinking they had an ally in the British who controlled Fort Miami nearby, the survivors rushed to the gates. But the commanding officer of the fort, British Major William Campbell, refused to open the gates of Fort Miami to give them refuge. Not wanting to start another war with the Americans, the battle ended in a Native American coalition ceding most of Ohio to the U.S. Battle of Tippecanoe In 1811, Shawnee Chief Tecumseh and his brother Tenskwatawa, known as the Prophet, founded the village of Prophetstown in Indiana as a base to resist white encroachment onto Native land. In response, Governor William Henry Harrison marched an army of 1,100 to confront them. On November 7th, the Prophet and his brother Tecumseh launched a surprise attack on Harrison's camp, kicking off two hours of fighting before they were eventually pushed back. Although Harrison's men suffered nearly 200 casualties, he was celebrated as a hero for the victory. In 1840, his reputation helped him defeat incumbent Martin Van Buren with the slogan, Tip a Canoe and Tyler II, giving a tip of the cap to his famous battle. Dade's Battle in December of 1835, Major Francis Dade was leading 110 U.S. Army soldiers on a mission to reinforce Fort King in Florida amid tensions over forcibly relocating the Seminoles. On December 28th, they were ambushed by 180 Seminole warriors lying in wait along the route. In a surprise prearranged attack led by Chief Micanopy, the first volley killed Major Dade and half his men. After a few hours of fighting, only three U.S. soldiers survived, and one of those three later died of his wounds. The horrible defeat for the U.S. Army kicked off the Second Seminole War, which finally ended in 1842 after most of the remaining Seminoles had surrendered or fled deeper into Florida. No peace treaty was ever signed, though, and to this day, the Seminole are the only group of tribes in the U.S. to never sign one. Fort Parker Incident Cynthia Ann Parker had a serious case of Stockholm Syndrome. In 1836, when she was nine years old, she was kidnapped during a raid by a coalition of Comanche, Kiowa, and Wichita on Fort Parker in Texas. She spent most of the rest of her life with the Comanche, marrying one of their chiefs, Petanacona, and giving birth to a son, Quanah Parker, who would go on to become one of the most renowned Native American warriors in history. But in December of 1860, a group of Texas Rangers raided her Comanche camp and ended her husband and took Parker back. Parker's disappearance had become national news, and her uncle had spent decades trying to find her. But Cynthia Ann Parker was devastated and made multiple attempts to escape back to the Comanche instead of staying with her biological family. Sand Creek In 1864, tensions were rising between Native Americans and Colorado settlers. Chief Black Kettle had secured lands for the Cheyenne and the Arapaho in 1861, which ceded a bunch of their lands but guaranteed them a 600-square-mile reservation. But still, fighting continued. In November of 1864, Black Kettle's peaceful band had relocated to Sand Creek near Fort Lyon, encouraged by the U.S. Governor of the Colorado Territory, John Evans, who was really just playing so-called friendly tribes from unfriendly ones by moving the friendly ones closer to U.S. forts. 
While they were camped out by Sand Creek, Colonel John Shivington and his Colorado Volunteer Militia attacked the village. Shivington's men burned the village before returning to rounds of applause. As the circumstances emerged, the sad event was condemned after initially being praised. Black Kettle survived, but peace talks were over. The Fetterman Fight In 1866, Tensions were rising yet again, this time in Wyoming over the Bozeman Trail, which illegally cut through Lakota Sioux hunting grounds. When Sioux warrior Crazy Horse realized he could lure soldiers into ambushes, he and his Lakota Sioux ally Red Cloud set a trap by Fort Phil Kearney. On December 21st, Crazy Horse tricked U.S. Colonel Fetterman and 80 cavalrymen into chasing his decoys, where 2,000 waiting Native Americans cut them all down with deadly accurate arrows. No one survived the attack. It was the U.S. Army's worst defeat in the West at the time. The event forced the military to ultimately abandon other forts in the area, forts that were secured by broken treaties as the U.S. government failed to hold up its end of one treaty after another with the natives. Battle of Beecher Island In September 1868, Major George Forsyth led a small band of 50 frontier scouts in pursuit of hostile Native American warriors in Colorado. When hundreds of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho attacked their camp, the scouts took refuge on a small island in the Arikari River. Scouts Jack Stilwell and Pierre French Pete Trudeau managed to slip past their attackers onto the mainland, walking backward to disguise their attacks. On their third night, they spotted a Cheyenne village on the move at dawn and took cover in the bones and remaining hide of a buffalo that had been killed the previous winter. The carcass tent shielded them as the Cheyenne passed nearby. They eventually made it to nearby Fort Wallace, and reinforcements were called in to help the scouts trapped on the island. Fortunately for them, the Native American coalition had left, and the survivors were rescued. Battle of Washita River Let's talk about Custer's pre-Custer's last stand. In 1868, Lieutenant Colonel George Custer was convicted in a military court of mistreating soldiers and deserting his command post. He was suspended for a year, but after just 10 months, General Philip Sheridan reinstated him. Sheridan was frustrated with failure after failure by the military to subdue Native American raiders in the West and figured Custer would be a good guy to lead the 7th Cavalry against the Cheyenne. In November, Custer located a peaceful Cheyenne village in Oklahoma Territory. The village was flying a white flag, an indication that the village wanted no part in armed conflict. Custer wasn't convinced, but he also didn't do any recon on the village to see exactly what was going on. Instead, he attacked one day at dawn, killing over 100, including Chief Black Kettle. Although it was billed as a victory, Custer's questionable assault on an unknown village would be a bad omen for his ultimate whoopsie eight years later at Little Bighorn. Battle of Summit Springs But there were some important battles in the meantime. In July 1869, Colonel Eugene Carr led 244 cavalrymen and 50 Pawnee scouts to retaliate against Cheyenne raids in Kansas. Among them was none other than Buffalo Bill Cody. After some recon, they launched a surprise attack on 85 Cheyenne Lodges led by Chief Tallbull. Carr had encircled the camp, unleashing devastation from three sides at once. After 50 Cheyenne were killed, including Tallbull, fragmenting his deadly group of warriors known as Dog Soldiers. The Dog Soldiers were one of six Cheyenne military societies that evolved in the 1830s into a separate militaristic band dominating Cheyenne resistance to U.S. westward expansion in the Great Plains. The one-sided battle crushed Cheyenne resistance on the Colorado Plains and made sure the dog soldiers would never regain their power. Battle of Adobe Walls In June 1874, over 700 Native American warriors led by Chief Quanna Parker attacked the Adobe Walls trading post in what's now Hutchinson County, Texas. Parker's goal was to eliminate the threat of encroaching buffalo hunters. Though the initial attack nearly overwhelmed the 28 men trapped inside, the hunters rallied behind their long-range rifles. On the third day, a guy named Billy Dixon made a legendary shot by dropping a warrior off his horse from nearly a mile away. Allegedly. This single rifle shot apparently made Quan and his men think twice, and they cut their attack short even though they outnumbered the hunters. Adobe Walls marked one of the Native Americans' last major victories, but Dixon's improbable sharpshooting feat became a legendary Wild West story in its own right. Battle of Palo Duro Canyon A few months later, Comanche warriors led by Lone Wolf took refuge at Palo Duro Canyon, stockpiling supplies and waiting for the right time to strike. A guy named Colonel McKenzie was tasked with leading the U.S. Cavalry column to hunt them down. Eventually, some of McKenzie's scouts figured out where the Comanche were camped, and on September 28th, the attack began. Lone Wolf's camp was routed. 
Faced with steep cliffs and relentless fire, some soldiers retreated while others destroyed supplies. Almost 2,000 horses were captured. The decisive U.S. victory shattered the Comanche safe haven and winter supplies. Many surrendered by November, marking the end of a major conflict in what's known as the Red River War. Battle of Little Bighorn Gold ignited a powder keg in 1876. Native American defiance against forced relocation onto reservations boiled over as Lakota and Cheyenne warriors, led by Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, gathered by the Little Bighorn in Montana. Over 10,000 strong, they defy orders to return to their reservations. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Custer led 600 cavalrymen on a scouting mission, tragically unaware of the actual size of the Native American force. Underestimating their strength, he recklessly split up his troops, sending them hurtling towards one of the worst defeats in the Indian Wars. Within hours, Custer and 200 men were overwhelmed and nearly all of them perished. The resounding Native American victory became known as Custer's Last Stand. But it was only a temporary victory for the Lakota and the Cheyenne. Within five years, most tribes were forced onto reservations. The Indian Wars were coming to an end, but there would be a few more tragic conflicts in the meantime. Battle of Milk Creek In September 1879, Major Thomas Thornburg led a small expedition to investigate a rebellion at the White River Ute Agency out in western Colorado. Ignoring multiple warnings from Ute chiefs, Thornburg crossed into Ute territory, which provoked a surprise attack that killed the Major and left his forces in a bad spot. The most intense fighting lasted six hours, but the whole battle would take a week. When the soldiers realized what was happening, they made a circle with their wagons for cover and held off the Ute attack, who had to higher ground and were trying to pick off the U.S. soldiers from above. After a week-long siege, the cavalry was finally rescued by reinforcements from Fort Fred Steel. The incident heightened tensions and led to the Meeker incident, where Utes killed Indian agent Nathan Meeker and 10 other men. The incident and battle ultimately gave justification for politicians to avoid a bunch of treaties and force the Utes out of Colorado entirely by 1881. Battle of Fort Apache in September 1881, Apache warriors attacked Fort Apache in eastern Arizona in retaliation for a recent battle of Sibiqiu Creek, where a medicine man named Noche Delklin, hope I got that right, was killed by the U.S. Army. The Apaches repeatedly fired on the fort from long range over the course of a day, scoring some hits, while the cavalry garrison returned fire. After several attacks were repelled, the Apaches retreated by sunset with unknown casualties. Only three soldiers were wounded. The siege sparked other Apaches to abandon reservations and join up with Geronimo in his ongoing war against the U.S. and Mexican armies. The battles at Civic U Creek and Fort Apache helped ignite another Apache conflict in Arizona that lasted five more years until Geronimo finally surrendered in 1866. Geronimo's War Let's talk a bit more about Geronimo and specifically his hatred for the Mexican army. On March 5, 1851, 400 Mexican troops attacked the Apache warriors' camp in Hano, Chihuahua. During the raid, Geronimo's wife, three children, and mother all lost their lives. Enraged and heartbroken, he went on a rampage against the Mexican army. After his entire family was taken out, he persuaded Apache leaders Mangos Colorados and Cochise to assemble a war party to raid Mexican settlements. Geronimo led the Apaches to attack a Mexican cavalry and infantry force near Arispe and Sonora. During a wild two-hour battle, Geronimo aggressively led charge after charge. In the bloody aftermath, he was made an Apache war chief. He'd go down as one of the fiercest warriors of his era. Wounded Knee Wounded Knee is widely considered the last major conflict in the Indian Wars, and it was yet again another tragic one. The event was a response to the Ghost Dance Movement, which the U.S. feared would incite Native American rebellion. The Ghost Dance was a religious revival promising the return of the dead and the removal of white settlers. It had spread among the Lakota, who had been displaced onto reservations for years and years. In December 1890, the arrest and killing of Chief Sitting Bull had only made tensions worse. The Lakota were looking for protection, and many had given up hope. But a misinterpreted dance led U.S. troops to open fire on a Ghost Dance ceremony. Sadly, hundreds lost their lives. Despite calls for the Medals of Honor to be taken back, the U.S. government has still only issued an apology. Wounded Knee was the last major conflict between the U.S. Army and Native American tribes. It's a sad saga in American history, one marked by bloodshed and tears as tribes across the country were systematically removed from their land and left to perish. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you love this kind of Native American content, like and share the video with someone who would too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to keep up to date with all the videos about the nutty side 
of human history.